Thank you for joining us today at Connection Point. Whether this is one of your first times joining us or you've been with us for a while, we are so glad that you're here. I want to take a minute to personally invite you to connect with us as we get started today. All you need to do is text the word CONNECT to the number on the screen and you'll receive a listing of all the ways you can connect this weekend. We've got an opportunity for you to take your next step in your spiritual journey. Next Steps is a class we offer on Sunday mornings at 9.15 a.m. in our building and Thursday evenings over Zoom. This is a great way for you to learn more about your faith and the unique gifts that God has given you to serve others and will also help you plug into community at Connection Point. We're excited to share that the next round of Financial Peace University starts September 26th. Financial Peace University is a life-changing class that shows you how to reach your financial goals by effectively eliminating debt, saving for the future, and being charitable. We believe so strongly this opportunity and the impact that it can make that we are waiving the fee to take this course for all Connection Point attendees. So be sure to check out this impactful financial opportunity. You can do these things by simply texting the word CONNECT to 317-350-1996 to learn more about our Next Steps class, Financial Peace University, and all the ways you can connect with us this weekend. Parents, don't forget we have an on-demand worship experience for your kids birth through elementary. You can head to connectionpoint.org backslash kids online to watch these services at any time. One more thing before we get started. We have a time of communion for you at the end of our service today. You can stay tuned at the end for communion, or you can access this on-demand communion experience in our weekly Saturday email. Grab some crackers and juice and make sure you take advantage of this meaningful experience. Well, thank you for joining us this weekend. Let's get ready to worship. We're going to worship the King together in this place. Sing out. Let joy fill this room. We have a reason to sing. Come on, let's sing it. Hey. I've searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, treasures that fail. I never
remember that day. It's etched in our minds, a permanent reminder of tragedy. We all watched helplessly as lives were lost, heroes were born, and a nation was forever changed. The loss was unimaginable, the sorrow unbearable, but through that pain, 
we witnessed the resolve of a nation. We saw chaos give birth to courage. Fear transform into fortitude and destruction give way to determination. In the midst of the brokenness, freedom stood immovable. Today, we remember those we lost. We honor the heroes who saved so many and grieve with the families who have suffered so much. It's been 20 years, but we still remember, and we will never forget. Well, I just want to take a moment on this solemn weekend to kind of give us some spiritual leadership out of the September 11th. 20-year anniversary. Obviously, we remember those who lost their lives. We remember the sacrifices. Uh, I've been praying this week about how to best lead us through a moment like this, and, and even as, with my three elementary-age kids, praying for them. And one of the things I realized as I've been talking with my kids who weren't born yet on September 11th, 2001, uh, is that we remember the tragedy. We remember the heroes we remember the pain, but we also have to remember that it wasn't an accident. Uh, it wasn't like a, a car crash or something. Um, there were intelligent people who trained for years and prepared to intentionally perform that evil. And they did so because of what they believed. They believed that was the right thing to do, as unthinkable as that is to us. Uh, and sometimes in this world, we wonder, you know, does it really matter that much what people believe? And September 11th uh, is horrific proof that what people believe is a matter of life and death. Uh, and as I've been praying about that, I came across a pastor named Andy Stanley. And um, what I would say in probably about two hours, he said in three or four paragraphs here, uh, so I'm going to spare you all and read you uh, Andy's paragraphs. He said, once upon a time, terror was the dominant tool used by those in power to maintain their power. And if we look back through world history, that is the norm. The society we've been born into where we have a vote and people of all different kinds uh, are uh, intended to have equal treatment, uh, that's not normal. Uh, in fact, throughout history, uh, you know, beheadings and violence, people in power used violence to maintain their power. Then a rabbi from Nazareth introduced a different paradigm for power. He was the king who came to reverse the order of things. He would lay down his life for his subjects instead of requiring that they lay down their lives for him. He came not to be served, but to serve, and in the end, to give his life a ransom for many. The kingdom values of Jesus of Nazareth introduced the world to what is now Western civilization. That's what we've been born into, imperfect, but something that has been largely shaped by Jesus. 20 years ago, we were reminded that our struggle is in fact not simply against flesh and blood. It's not merely geopolitical. It's not nation against nation. It can't even be reduced to conflicting worldviews. Our assumptions regarding freedom and the dignity of all humans are inextricably linked to a man who claimed to be God and validated that claim by predicting his own death and his resurrection and then pulling them off. As difficult as it will be for some to acknowledge, the battle lines are drawn in the realm of theology. If God is love, as we believe, then we should love one another. If God so loved us that he gave, then we should freely give to one another. If God sent his son to carry our burdens, we should carry one another's burdens as well. If the truth of Jesus sets us free, we in churches should create a culture characterized by freedom and dignity. Where the law of Christ is recognized and embraced, people prosper. And you can trace that through human history. Christians go places and they start orphanages and hospitals and universities. Where the law of Christ is ignored or rejected, people suffer. 
women and children in particular. And you can see that right now in places like Afghanistan where Christianity is not allowed. Uh, women's rights tend to go right away when Christianity is not allowed. So to my fellow Jesus followers, it is more important than ever that we let our lights shine in such a way that people see our good works and recognize our devotion to our Father in heaven and to his Son who modeled the way. So I want to encourage you, church, anytime we're confronted with evil here at home or abroad, that we remind ourselves of what Jesus said in Matthew 5. He came into this world as the light of the world. And now as his followers, we are to be a light that shines. Uh, when the world gets clouded with evil, we're to be a light that shines. Uh, and as horrific as things like September 11th are, they serve for us, for me, as a motivation. That what we're doing, connecting people to the source of life and truth, who can change families and even cultures, this is actually the most important work in the world. Uh, and church, I just want to applaud you and say, way to go. Because together, as we all serve and give and are faithful, we are shining that light right here in central Indiana. We're also shining that light around the world. Um, we've got missionaries right there bordering Afghanistan who are bringing in refugees who are fleeing from the Taliban, and they're giving them water, they're giving them food, and giving them the good news of Jesus. So church, we're doing it. And when we see evil, let us not be overcome by it, but resolve to overcome evil with good. How do we do that? By uh, following Jesus and continuing to do his work. So I just want to pray that over you on this really significant weekend, and then we'll get into our message together. Father, I thank you for uh, every person who's with us in this moment, many online, many in, in this building as well. And God, over every single person, I just pray that we would hear from you today. Lord, for the person who's doubting or wondering or not sure what they believe, that they would hear from you today. Lord, for the person who's a believer and uh, their heart is just grieved by the evils of the world, by the injustices, uh, may we find deep renewal in you today. Lord, that you would strengthen our roots, that you would strengthen our faith. Uh, Father, in this world of evil, you have appointed us to be your agents of goodness, of mercy, of truth, and of light and life. And so, God, I pray that you would strengthen us, that we would shine the light brightly, and that we'd connect many people to you in a way that changes their lives here and gives them eternal life as well. Speak to us now, Lord, from your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're kicking off a series today called Some Good News, and we started planning this back in August. I was just realizing, like, oh my goodness, I need some good news in my life. Uh, it is just like every day there's more bad news, and so here in the month of September, we're going to be studying good news in the Word of God, and I want to start off with a couple actual news stories that are good news. First one's about a dog named Abby who lived in Dothan, Alabama. Her owner, June Roundtree, and her husband lost her. She uh, was on a collar in their backyard. She wiggled out of the collar. She was lost for three weeks. So June and her husband, they went around door to door in their neighborhood. Have you seen our dog, Abby? They put up posters. They went on the next door app. No luck finding Abby. Well, three weeks later, June was working at Walmart, miles away from their house. And as she's working as a cashier, checking people out, she hears this ruckus in the Walmart. And it turns out there's a dog, a stray dog somehow got into Walmart and is running around the store. And of course, customers are like avoiding it, not sure, is this dog safe? Uh, employees are trying to tackle it, but to no avail. And this dog makes its way to June's register, miles from home, and it's Abby. She found her owner miles away. Isn't that great? There's some good news in the world. All the dog lovers rejoice. I love that. Here's a, a, a really uh, meaningful one. The world's smallest known baby at birth was born in June of 2020, weighed less than half a pound, 7.5 ounces. That's about the weight of an apple or a softball. After a full year in the hospital there in Singapore, Kwek Yu Wan has been released. She's now up to 14 pounds, uh, fully, fully restored, fully uh, sustained during the last year. And now her parents, who delivered this tiny, tiny baby, are taking her home. There's 
good news, even in this crazy world. We need good news right now, don't we? You know, what we set our minds on affects our emotions. If you're like me, a lot of days you think like, oh, I, I, I want my emotions to be happier than they are, but I don't know how to control my emotions. We actually can control them, but it's indirectly. It's by controlling our thoughts, choosing what we meditate on. You know, it's been a rough last 18 months, and I almost feel uh, like a broken record saying that because I, I've been saying that all through the summer, but I continue to meet people uh, who just aren't back to normal from pre-2020 life. One of those people that I met was a mentor of mine, really, really strong person, very strong leader who has led thousands of people for 20 or 30 years. And as he and I had lunch one day, he just said, John, I am so fatigued. He said, John, I just, I haven't really recovered from the last year and a half. Uh, between all the challenges as a leader, all the division of people getting mad at each other over different things, all the different times I had to say something, all the different times I didn't say something. I mean, this is a guy who has led through all sorts of things for decades, and he looked at me and he just said, John, I just haven't recovered. He told me about a gathering where once a year he gets together with a number of other really high-level leaders from across the country. And he said, typically, this gathering once a year is really a time of, of strategy and, and encouragement. You know, what are you doing that's working? And he said, John, when we all got together, someone asked the question, like, how are you actually doing? He said, John, one by one, I watched some of the most dynamic leaders in our country just break down in tears, one after another, just saying, I am so fatigued. I'm experiencing anxiety that I didn't used to experience. I don't know how to fully come back from this. Now, I'm not declaring that that's your reality. If it's not, if you're here and you're like, well, John, this message isn't for me. I'm doing great. Good for you. Please be in a small group and encourage the rest of us who are struggling. Because some of us just feel that way. Like, we know God's in control and we love God and he's got a plan, but just uh, it's just not quite back to normal as far as internal peace and anxiety, frustration. You know, there's different kinds of people when it comes to good news. There's people who life's going pretty well and like, yeah, hearing a cute good news story is great. And there's other people who are desperate for good news. Have you ever been in the position where uh, you've had a biopsy and you're waiting for that phone call of the test results? Um, I had that once, this was years ago, when we lived in Arizona. I had a little tumor on my elbow, and my uh, blood work was off. My white blood cell count was really high, and so my doctor wanted me to go get a biopsy. And I remember waiting for that thing. Now, in that moment, I was hungry for good news at a whole different level. And I want you to just be honest between you and God today. Where are you hungry for some good news? What's the situation where you're worried or you're fatigued, where you're anxious or you're afraid? We're going to study this word, the good news or the gospel, through the New Testament here in September. Now, if you've been in church for a while, you've probably heard this phrase before, the gospel. Uh, in fact, some churches are guilty of kind of overusing it. It's like the gospel this, the gospel that, and it's like churchy's language. You walk in as an outsider, you're like, what in the world does that even mean? And then if you hang around for a little while, you'll hear them explain, well, the gospel means good news, and, and that's true. But I'm going to take you deeper into that today and here in the month of September. But for it to really connect with you at the heart level, you've got to start by being honest with God about where you need some good news. What is it that's oppressing you right now? What is it that you're grieved by? What is it that is limiting you in your life? Or as Jesus often said in the Gospels, when people would come to him for healing, he'd say, what are you seeking? Well, Lord, I, I want to see. Or I want my daughter to be healed. What are you seeking? Where do you need help? And we're going to learn here in September, not just some good news, but the good news, which is for nations, for all people in history, but it's also for you. It's for your family. It's for your needs. It's for the areas in life where you need some good news. So I want to connect this to your fatigue, your anxiety, your frustration. And forgive me, I'm going to go a little bit nerdy. Some of you know I'm a nerd. That's my true inner core person is a nerd. 
And there, there's a word in the Greek language which the New Testament is written in that we translate the gospel. Uh, in this word, if you were to take these Greek letters and make them English letters, it would be E-V-A-N-G. Those turn into an N-G-E-L. Evangel. Uh, in fact, this is where my daughter's name comes from. My daughter, Evangeline, uh, her name comes from this word of the gospel or the good news. Uh, a couple other words you'd recognize from this evangelist, evangelism, evangelical. They all come from this word, which we translate gospel typically. Uh, something I want to point out to you today that even if you've been in church your whole life, I'm guessing you've never heard before, is the literal meaning. What this is, is two words smashed together. That's a word, uh, and that's a word there. Eva sounds like Eve, right? And because of Eve, it literally means life. Eva means life. Now, this second word, angelion, is actually our word for angel. That's where angel comes from. An angel is a messenger. And so the evangelion is literally the life messenger. Do you see how they get good news out of that? But, but think about it more literally. Wherever there is death, there's a message of life. And there's different forms of death, right? There's death where you're at a graveside. We will all encounter that with people we love. And someday the people we love will encounter that for us. There's also deaths of marriages. There's relationships that die. There are dreams that die. Uh, sometimes, as in Afghanistan right now, freedom dies. Human rights sometimes die. Sometimes when there's a lot of deception and confusion, the truth dies. For every form of death that you encounter in your life, there's a life messenger. So the gospel is not just some church phrase. It is the message of life wherever you are encountering death. And I just want you today as we start this study of this word to open your heart to God wherever there's fatigue or fear or anxiety and just invite him right now. God, would you minister your life to me where I need life ministered to me? Sometimes you might need that in the first sense of believing in Jesus for the first time. And then as you follow him, uh, this world will spew death at you in all sorts of different ways. Like debris raining down and clouds of smoke. We get death on us and we have to keep going back to the life messenger. Now, when we study the word of God, which is always the standard for what we believe here, and I hope you know this, if you ever move or go to a different church, you've always got to be every weekend in a church that is preaching the word of God. Uh, please don't come here to hear from me or whoever's on stage. Come here to hear from the word of God. And we can study the word of God a number of different ways. Just bear with me. I just want to go a little bit deeper here. You can study a theme through the word of God. So we did that earlier this year when we studied shame. And you can start in Genesis and go all the way through the Bible and you can study a theme. Uh, you can also study a book. There's 66 books in the Bible. So you might take like a, a short one like Ephesians or James and you can read that book, which is really just a few chapters. Book sounds intimidating. Another way you can study the word of God is what's called a word study. And that's what we're doing here in September. We're studying this word of life messenger. And by the way, if you were with us in August when we did the welcome home series, we also did a word study. We studied the Greek word for home or for house. So I, I just want to give you that because if you don't yet have a Bible you love reading, we will give you one, the same life application study Bible that I preach from. We've got them at our connection corner. If you're online, text the word Bible to us. We want you reading the word of God for yourself even as you gather here every weekend to kind of get a prepared meal, uh, eventually you start to learn to feed yourself as well. And word studies are a great way to do that. Okay, let's jump in to our word study from the Gospel of Mark. The beginning of the good news. That's our word for gospel, the life messenger. The beginning of the life message about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. So right there in the very first verse of Mark chapter 1, you actually get a, one summary of what is the gospel. What are we talking about? We're talking about the fact that Jesus is God, that he's the Messiah. In other words, it's this assumption that in a world defined by evil and death and brokenness, that there's a God who loves us and that he came into this world to rescue us. That's what the Messiah is. 
and that Jesus is the Messiah. So Jesus is not just a good example or an inspiring teacher or a moral model. Those things are true. But Jesus claimed to be God. And at a certain point in your life, you have to decide for yourself, do you believe Jesus claimed that he's God? And the only alternative to that is he's a liar because he said he was. So Jesus is either a liar or he actually is God. And if he actually is God and he claimed, I came to bring life to any area of your life that is dying or dead, that can change us here and then for all of eternity. Now, just a little bit about this Gospel of Mark. Bear with me. This will be real fast summary here. There are four books of the Bible out of the 66 that are called the Gospels. Why are they called that? Because they tell us the life of Jesus specifically. All the other books tell us about how God works in the world. They're all God's word. But there's four biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if you wonder, why is there four of them? A good analogy is this. Uh, if a car accident occurs at an intersection, and there's people standing on the four corners of the intersection, like for the crosswalks, and then afterwards, uh, the police officers ask those four people at the four corners, what did you see? You're going to get a slightly different answer from the different perspective of the four corners around the intersection. Does that make one true and one false? No, they're all true. And when you piece them all together, you get a 360 degree view of what happened. So in the same way, God gave us four people who had seen Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we get their four views of Jesus' life. And they don't contradict, but they do complement. For example, Mark is written to non-Jewish people. And so Mark will explain for us non-Jewish folks a lot of the Jewish customs, whereas uh, Matthew and Luke and John, they assume that their audience is Jewish and knows those things. Another thing for those of us who maybe have ADHD or if you don't love reading, Mark will probably become your favorite of the four Gospels. Here's why. It's the fastest pace. It's all about action. He cuts out the dialogue where Matthew's like, Jesus gave this sermon and here's three chapters of the sermon. Mark's like, Jesus gave a sermon, period. Mark is like, he is to the point. So if that's your style, this will be your favorite of the four Gospels. Uh, he cuts right to the movement. And, and here's kind of the summary of the Gospel according to Mark. Jesus is God. And Jesus came with the assumption that when the world was created, it was perfect. There was no death. There was no cancer. There was no murder. There was no war. Satan is a real being who came into this world to kill, steal, and destroy. He deceived Adam and Eve that ripped all of humanity away from God, who is the life giver of the universe. As a result, um, we're like this blinking thing out in the universe that has a remnant of life in it, all of planet Earth, but is disconnected from the life source. You see that in the planet as well. And, and then what, what Mark is going to say is Jesus came down to us to reconnect us back to the life source. And that the cross was the pinnacle of essentially plugging planet Earth back into access of heaven's power. And now for all who believe in Jesus, we're plugged into that power. And then what Mark is going to say throughout his gospel is this. Just like it was really hard for the disciples when Jesus was walking on Earth to believe that he was going to die on a cross and raise from the dead, now it's really hard for us to believe that this Jesus who we can't see with our eyes is in another dimension called heaven is going to return in the clouds one day with an army of angels and judge evil and rescue out all who've believed in him. That's hard to believe in, right? That's, that's big. That's kind of out there. That's part of the gospel. It goes all the way back in human history. It goes all the way forward. And the middle, the pinnacle, is the cross that Jesus died for our sins and rose again. Okay, let's jump into the action. Verse 9. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and he was baptized by John his cousin, a prophet, in the Jordan River. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open. Real quick here. Space astrophysicists, that's a kind of scientist who deals with like, you know, black holes and the fabric of the universe and physics out there. Um, they, they're convinced for the most part that there are other dimensions that we're unable to access. I know that sounds really sci-fi, it, it sounded sci-fi uh, hundreds of years ago when scientists who were Christians said, the world is not flat, it's round. People are like, what? It looks flat to me, right? Point is this, whether you want to call it other dimensions or heaven and hell, by the Bible, God's word talks about two very real other dimensions, uh, heaven and hell. 
And, and what's beautiful about this moment is when Jesus came to earth, he opened a gateway between heaven and earth. And I love this moment where we get to kind of physically see what is happening in the supernatural realm, a tear in the fabric, and heaven gets opened. And the people who are there as Jesus is getting baptized, they, they see the spirit of God descend down and then listen to what they hear with their ears. A voice came from heaven. This is my beloved son, or you are my son, speaking to Jesus, whom I love with you. I am well pleased. So here we are only 11 verses into Mark's life message about Jesus. And we're already told this. Jesus is God. Jesus opens the gateway into heaven. And when you believe in Jesus for yourself, the pleasure of God gets appointed to you. Like a parent to their son or daughter saying, that a boy or that a girl. That is available to you the moment you trust in Jesus. God, for the rest of your life, says, I'm so pleased with you. He sees you through the lens of Jesus' perfection. And then pretty early on, we're introduced to the reality that there is spiritual warfare in the universe, that there's good and evil. And again, some people might say, oh, good and evil, are those, does that really matter? And I would say again, sadly, look to September 11th. There is evil in this world. In fact, if you go uh, to some of those nations like Afghanistan and see what life is like every single day for women, uh, evil is very real in this world. And because Jesus brought good news that is good news that overcomes evil, he's going to encounter evil over and over during his ministry. Now, bear with me for a second here. I want you to think of two different kinds of good news. There's good news when you're waiting for the phone call of the biopsy results. Is it cancer or is it not cancer? That's meaningful good news because you're in a storm of darkness. Do I have cancer or not? Then there's good news over here. We're like, everything's fine in life, and it's a funny cat video on social media. Right? It's kind of sugary. It's kind of fluffy. It's good news, but it really doesn't affect you. You get the difference? Jesus is not over here. I mean, I'm sure he's fine with funny cat videos, okay? But what I mean is this. His good news is not a little bit of icing or sugar to put on your life and just make you feel better for a moment. His good news is all about the darkness and the evil in your life and how they can be resolved and solved here in this life and for all of eternity. So that's why we're going to see right from the beginning, Jesus confronts evil. In fact, verse 12 says this, the spirit sent Jesus out into the wilderness. That's weird. Why would the spirit of God lead Jesus to the wilderness? Verse 13 tells us so. He was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. Again, you might think weird. What's the point of that? Here's the point of that. Satan, real spiritual being in the unseen realm, is the one who ripped all of humanity away from God. That goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve, real people, chose to invite evil into this world because they were deceived, tempted by Satan. Jesus came as the second Adam and Eve, if you will, the second version of humanity, the perfect version of humanity who wouldn't sin. And so right away, Jesus is going to encounter the most evil being in the universe. And where Adam and Eve failed, and by the way, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Jesus is going to demonstrate that as fully God, the Messiah, he can encounter Satan head on for 40 days, even when he's removed from heaven and he's limited in a human body, he's fasting for 40 days, he's hungry, he's tired, he's lonely, and he can have victory where we otherwise would have defeat. He was with the wild animals and the angels attended to him. The struggle between good and evil continues, verse 14 after John was put in prison. So that same John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, who baptized him in the Jordan River, uh, gets arrested by Herod, and he gets thrown in prison. And sometimes in this life, we might think, you know, if God's with us and God's for us, why do Christians get persecuted? It's because there's a struggle between good and evil. And that was happening even during Jesus' ministry. Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. That's our word that we're studying. 
It's three times here in Mark chapter one, the good news. So uh, let's just do a little something here. When the word good news comes up, I want you guys to be interactive with me, okay? And say the good news out loud. Remember, it means the life message or the life messenger. So uh, you're just gonna say good news, those two blue words when I get to them. Are you guys ready? You guys ready? Okay. Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the? Don't tell the 915 service. You guys were louder. It's true. It's, it's, it's recorded. It's, okay. Verse 15. Here's what Jesus then said. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. So how do you receive the kingdom of God? Repent. That's a simple saying. God, I need you. There are forces of death in my life that I cannot defeat. Sometimes they're within me. Sometimes they're around me. But I need you, God. I need your help. And believe. Believe what? Jesus, you're the Messiah. You're the solution to my problem. Repent and believe the? Come on, you guys. Very well done. All right. Here's your big idea about Jesus today. You need to know this. Jesus is the life messenger in a world of death. And I just want to invite you to apply that around your heart. You know, kind of put, push that in there into the cracks and crevices of your heart where you're recovering from uh, a relationship that died or a dream that died or hope that died, or, or maybe you're grieving a physical death of a loved one right now, or maybe you're going through sickness and you fear death. Jesus is the life messenger for that. He brings you a message of life for that pain, for that brokenness. I love how Luke's gospel starts with an angel. Maybe you've heard this at Christmas time. Behold, I bring you good news, the gospel, which shall be for all people. It's for everyone. In fact, our word ethnicity comes from a word in the Bible called ethnos. And Jesus, at the end of his ministry, after he raises from the dead, he's going to tell his followers, now go and tell all the ethnicities, the ethnoi, all the nations, this good news, that there's a God who loves you, that there's freedom, that there's forgiveness for sins, that when you believe this, it transforms the way you treat the people around you. And it gives you eternal life in heaven. It's for all nations, but you got to know today it's for you. God loves you. God came to this world for you. And in your fatigue, in your frustration, in your brokenness, he's reaching out to you with a life message. Well, as I prayed for you all this week and earlier, I mentioned just that kind of fatigue and anxiety. Um. I was reading the Gospel of Mark and praying for all of you, and I came across this story in the Gospel of Mark where the followers of Jesus are feeling frustrated, they're feeling confused, they're feeling fatigued, and in fact, they're going to be overcome by anxiety and emotion in a time of crisis, and it's in Mark 14, verse 50. This is right after Jesus has washed the disciples' feet, and he's been explaining to them that as the Messiah, he needs to die on the cross for the sins of the world. They're really struggling to comprehend that, just like we struggle to comprehend that he's going to return from heaven. They're struggling with that, and then Jesus gets betrayed by Judas, one of his disciples. And the other disciples are like, what's going on? And this army shows up, a mob with clubs and swords and torches. It's dark. It's night. They're out on a mountainside garden called the Garden of Olives. And, and there they are. And the disciples, as this army approaches, they, they just panic. And they desert him. And they run away. And it's this moment where faithful followers of Jesus are just overcome by the emotion of what they're going through. Because it's one thing to believe and follow. It's another thing when you encounter physical violence directly, most of us run. And the disciples run. Now, this next detail that we get is only in the Gospel of Mark. And it's okay if you chuckle a little bit when you first hear it. Okay, so let's read it and you can chuckle and then we'll uh, talk about the significance of it. Jesus, in addition to his closest disciples, Peter, James, John, there were many other women and young people who would follow Jesus around. And one of them is this young guy. He's probably around 12 years old. And one young man following behind was clothed only in a long linen shirt. Now, this was not like a shirt you buy at Walmart because they didn't have Walmart. This would be almost like a toga kind of thing. It's a big garment. Uh, it's flowy robe. It's just one thing that was pretty common back then. 
And what happens is in the melee, when these soldiers are closing in to grab Jesus, and Jesus surrenders, because uh, if he wanted to resist him, he absolutely could have, and the disciples start to flee, and I mean, this is like, this is like a riot. This is a, the, the chaos is happening. And everyone's running for their lives, and someone in the mob grabs the toga cloak thing of this young man, probably 12 years old or so, and he's so afraid for his life as he's seeing Jesus get arrested. Now, Peter's darting off into the darkness, and all the strongest followers of Jesus he knows, they're all running away, and someone's got him, and he wiggles out of his toga thing, and he runs away naked. And I've always, you know, thought, like, what a weird detail in the Bible. But this week, as I was praying for us all and thinking about anxiety and fatigue, when I came across this moment, I just thought, oh, my goodness. Can you imagine how terrified this young man was? Like, to be so scared for your life that when someone grabs you, you wiggle out of your shirt and you just run off into the darkness. You're, I mean, just Talk about fear. Talk about anxiety. And what's interesting about this detail is that that young boy will grow up and will write the gospel of Mark. And when I learned that, I thought, that had to be so traumatizing. Why would he spend the rest of his life following Jesus and then write a gospel? Here's the reason, don't miss this. He saw that same Jesus crucified on the cross. And for three nights, he was completely hopeless. And then he saw with his own eyes that same Jesus, risen from the dead, eating food, talking. He saw with his own eyes that Jesus had died on the cross and risen from the dead. And the fact that he saw that with his own eyes is why he spent the rest of his life not traumatized and like, oh, that was the worst thing that ever happened to me. But like, here's a little detail of the night Jesus was arrested, because really it's a small detail in this big story that Jesus wins. Jesus wins. Yeah, we can celebrate that. And I think when we see evil and we feel like we're running through the darkness, afraid and alone and scared, we got to remind ourselves, Jesus wins in the end. We know how the story ends. We know that Jesus wins. And when it's dark and when we're cold and when we're running, when we're overcome with anxiety or fear, it's, it's normal in those moments to feel hopeless. But faith is choosing in those moments to say, I still believe that Jesus wins. You know, that little boy would grow up to write a book of the Bible because he saw Jesus raised from the dead. His darkest nights of hopelessness gave way to victory. And you need to know today that your darkest nights of hopelessness, they will give way to victory. Why? Because Jesus wins. Because Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus proved his words to be true to this young man named John Mark. And he will prove his words to be true to you as well. So if you're in the darkness, if you feel alone, if you've seen people around you run away when they should be standing strong, don't give up. Keep believing the good news. Now, I want to tell you a little about this young man named John Mark because we actually know quite a bit about him. Uh, we don't talk about him very often, but the, the whole council of God's word tells us quite a bit about this young man. And I relate to a lot of his things. I have not been streaking in the darkness. I don't relate in that way. But being afraid, running for your life, being overcome by emotion, I sure can relate to that. Let me tell you a little more about this young man. He was the son of an influential believer named Mary. This is not Mary, the mother of Jesus, or Mary Magdalene, but this is Mary who was a prominent figure in the book of Acts. Uh, in fact, if you go to Acts chapter 12, there's a story where Peter has been arrested and he's in prison, and everyone is at Mary's house praying for Peter to be released. And if you look in Acts chapter 12, God does this miracle and he breaks Peter out of prison 
And Peter shows up in the middle of the night and he's knocking on the door and people think it's like a prank because they're like, how, how could Peter actually be broken out of prison? That house was John Mark's childhood home, the home of Mary, his mother. He also had an uncle, Mary's brother, named Barnabas. Now, if you read through the New Testament, you'll meet Barnabas. He's typically known as an encourager. In fact, Barnabas would go with Paul the Apostle on his first missionary journey where they went out and they planted a bunch of churches and told people that Jesus was the Messiah. Uh, not only that, but uh, John Mark got to go with Barnabas and Paul on that journey. And it's a, a, another kind of one of these unusual details in the Bible because John Mark failed on that journey. He was with Peter and Barnabas, and he got uh, overcome with fear when they encountered some spiritual oppression, and he retreated. He ran uh, back to Jerusalem, and it's something that Paul would hold on to for a long time, that you can't count on John Mark. He's not reliable. He was frequently overcome by difficulties. He also ended up becoming the right-hand person to Peter. Remember, he would have been with Peter and the other disciples on that night when Jesus was arrested. And in fact, when you read through the Gospel of Mark, you'll find it's almost like the Gospel of Peter. A lot of it is from Peter's perspective. Why? Because Peter told John Mark. John Mark, who was from a wealthy family, knew how to write, and he wrote it down. So uh, in your study guide, you can get the references uh, for all these different instances of John Mark. A lot of it's in Acts 12 and in Acts chapter 13. I want to take you now into one more failure of John Mark, because I just, it's good for me. Uh, here it is in Acts 15. This is after he had abandoned Paul and Barnabas on their first mission trip. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord. That's the good news. And see, let's go see how those believers are doing. Well, Barnabas says, hey, let's take my nephew, John Mark. You remember John Mark, right? Let's take him with us. <laughs> Look at Paul's response, verse 38. Paul did not think it wise to take John Mark because he had deserted them and had not continued with them in the work. You know, Paul's one of these guys, he's like, um, we are doing the most important work in the world, so quitters are not allowed. <laughs> That's Paul the Apostle's take, right? He's like, hey, we were counting on this guy and he let us down. There's no room in my boat for people who are halfway about getting this message out. That's how Paul the Apostle was. And God used that in Paul the Apostle. But then God uses Barnabas as an encourager. Now look at this, verse 39. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas takes Mark or John Mark and sails for Cyprus. But Paul... Now he's without his kind of best buddy Barnabas because of this nephew, John Mark. Paul takes Silas, and they leave, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. Here's the point. This guy, John Mark, pretty much two of the biggest things we have about him in the Bible are times where he was just overcome by the emotion of the moment, and he failed twice. And God still chose him to write a book of the Bible. God still chose him to minister really to hundreds of millions of people over history who've read this. And I just want to give you a couple takeaways today. First is this, Jesus doesn't give up on you. Paul the Apostle gave up on John Mark, but Jesus didn't. Jesus doesn't give up on you when you're not strong enough. Jesus doesn't give up on you when you've messed up. Maybe this one's for you, when the emotions of a moment overwhelm you. And you just kind of can't bear it anymore. Jesus does not give up on you. Also, Jesus doesn't give up on you when other people do. Peter gave up on, uh, well, Paul gave up on John Mark. And then I guess another way to look at that is when the people around you fail, like Peter did. John Mark saw Peter fail. God, he still doesn't give up on you. What did John Mark do that kind of pulled him through his failures, his times when his emotions got the best of him, what is it that he did right that did keep him following Jesus over the course of his lifetime? And that's what I want to give you as we uh, wrap up today, four really simple things you can do today. Wherever you're fatigued, wherever you're fearful, uh, wherever you're overcome with anxiety or emotion, 
Um, you can be like John Mark, like Peter, and hopefully like me as well. None of us are perfect. And when God looks at our lives, he's not expecting that you never stumble and fall. But just like John Mark, what we do is after we stumble and fall, we get back up, we brush ourselves off, and we keep following Jesus. Uh, step one, where you're fatigued, remember Jesus said in Mark chapter one, repent and believe. So do you have a time in your life where you've believed in Jesus as the Messiah for yourself? Uh, not just because your parents said to, not just because all your friends do, but you yourself have repented and believed. Have you had that? Uh, one way to think of it is this. If your life were a timeline, your birthday all the way up till now, on that timeline, is there a flag somewhere that says on September 12th, 2021, she believed in Jesus for herself? Have you had that definitive moment? That is step one. And, and then after that is you repent and believe, and then you get baptized. And after you're baptized, now is following Jesus. That's what John Mark was doing. That night in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he ended up scattering, he was following Jesus. And he failed, but he got back up and he kept following Jesus. And then he failed again and he kept following Jesus. And we're going to fail thousands of times, but we keep getting back up. We keep following Jesus. And maybe God brought you here today because you just need to be reminded, like the way you push through the anxiety, the fatigue, the emotion, you get back up and you keep following Jesus. Step two, John Mark was able to keep following Jesus even after really traumatic and difficult things because he had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Now, we're on the other side of that, and we believe that by faith. We haven't seen Jesus' physical body with our eyes, and Jesus knows that. He actually said, blessed are those of you who believe without seeing. He knows it's harder for us to believe, but there's times where we have to remind ourselves, my God defeated death. And so whatever I'm up against right now, he can defeat that. He wins. And maybe step two is just those two words, Jesus wins. Maybe you need that reminder right now. If you've been overcome by evil in the world or uh, other deaths that you're facing, Jesus wins. He rose from the dead. Remind yourself of that. Third, John Mark, even though he messed up, he always got back in the middle of God's people. We see that in Acts 12, where they're all praying for Peter to get released from prison. He's right there in the middle of them. Then he goes on the missionary journeys. He messes up, but he's right back in the middle of God's people. Are you in the middle of God's people? Do you have a small group here? If not, go out to our lobby. We've got a booth that says groups, and just say, hey, I need a small group. Um, our small groups, a lot of them are starting back up right now. The one that Mel and I are in starts back up today. Uh, you've got to be in a small group where you've got other believers who are praying for you texting you about what's going on in your life. Uh, those are the people who show up for you uh, when you're sick or when you're in the hospital. Uh, be with God's people. And then fourth, become a life messenger yourself. Jesus is the life messenger. Jesus is the gospel. But as Christians, the word Christian means little Christs. We are to become like Christ. So we now live in this world of evil as little life messengers. And what a church is supposed to be is a big beacon of life and light. And what we are to be out in our schools and in our families is lights in the darkness. I'll close by telling you a true story of a guy named Michael Hinkson who was in the World Trade Center on September 11th. Michael Hinkson is blind. He was working on the 78th floor he says this, I wouldn't be alive today if it weren't for Roselle. That's his seeing eye dog. Roselle was asleep under Hingson's desk on the fateful morning as the sales manager busied himself for an upcoming seminar. Moments after an American Airlines jet slammed into the upper floors of the building and smoke began billowing from the side, Hingson, Roselle, and a group of coworkers from his office began the long, arduous trek down to the street below. As you probably know, the elevators are not working at this point. So 78 flights of stairs, if you can imagine that. And imagine that as someone who's visually impaired. As fumes from the jet's obliterated fuel tank began to fill the stairwell, Hingson clutched Roselle's leash, gently urging her on while firefighters rushed past in the opposite direction. The two of us had a very interdependent relationship, Hingson recalls. She kept me calm, and I just kept encouraging her. But Roselle's real strength 
became evident once they reached the ground. Just minutes before the Tower 2 came crashing down, blanketing the area in dense plumes of noxious dust, Hingson scrambled to get out of the area while debris was raining down on their heads. Quote, if I hadn't had Roselle, if I had only had a cane to depend on, I wouldn't have made it out. I just want to close with this idea. So we're born into such freedom and prosperity, it's easy to think that our kind of suburban lives are normal in human history. But the world Jesus came into, life expectancy was about half of what it is today. People saw death frequently. They didn't have hospitals like we have. They knew they needed a life message. And there are times in our lives where we're reminded we need a life message. It's easy for us to think that this world is our home and is heaven, but it's not. In fact, Jesus described that this world is on fire. This world's burning down because of what Satan has done. And there's only one way out, the way, the truth, and the life. There's only one stairwell that leads to eternal life, and that's through Jesus. Do you know today that you've believed him? And if you have, will you join me these next six days and saying, I'm not gonna be overcome by evil. I'm gonna become a life messenger. I'm gonna be someone who escorts other people down the stairs. And in my workplace, and in my school, in my neighborhood, when I meet people who are dealing with death, the death of a dream, the death of a relationship, physical death, I'm gonna speak up as a life messenger. I'm gonna let them know there's hope. There's good news. I'm gonna pray that for you. Father, across this place, Lord, we just invite your life message into the cracks and the crevices of our hearts. We invite you in for our salvation. We repent and believe. We invite you in for our restoration. We acknowledge that like John Mark, we fail over and over. We need you to pick us back up and restore us. Thank you that you don't give up on us. God, as we follow you like John Mark did, you're gonna use us to write words that bring life to speak words that bring life, to live lives that imitate the life messenger, that we'd bring a message of life to the people we work with, to the people in our neighborhoods, to the people in our families. So God, this week, would you empower us to be lights in the darkness, pointing the way to the light of the world, the life messenger, we pray in Jesus' name.
Thank you for joining us this week uh, to take communion together. And when we gather together each week to take communion, we're gathered around this story, our story and his story. This is God's word. And it's more than just a story about history or entertainment or, or good moral lessons. It's about salvation. And so we, we remember as we take these symbols of communion each week, the bread and the cup, that they symbolize that salvation. And they symbolize the story, what Jesus really did uh, for us. And so let's take the bread together and let's remember his body that was really given for us. And then we also take the cup and remember that he spilled his blood uh, for, for the forgiveness of our sins. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for who you really are, Lord. We thank you for this sacrifice and the grace that you offer. And we want to testify about your life and your death, but we also want to testify about your resurrection, how you conquered death. And Lord, we just thank you for your true story and how you forever changed our stories. In Jesus' name, amen.